To be or not to be, that is the question. Is it really, though? Who really decides who lives or dies? A good answer to that comes from Exodus 20:13, you shall not murder. If that's true, then can aborting a baby ever be just a matter of choice? More on this episode of Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. I'm Alexander Osborne. And I'm Thomas Bailey. On June 24, 2022, the U.S. Supreme Court made a landmark decision in the Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization case. This overturned the notorious Roe v. Wade decision of 1973, which had abolished all state abortion laws. Roe basically invented the notion that abortion was a constitutional right. And for decades, pro-abortionists celebrated this decision. But Dobbs has had pro-abortionists reacting vehemently at what they consider to be a loss of freedom for women. Some Christians have said we should commiserate with those who are hurting from this decision. Rather, at CMI, we commiserate with the approximately 63 million babies that were killed in the U.S. over 49 years, along with the many mothers who have regretted their abortions. Between 2010 and 2014, there were an estimated 56 million abortions per year worldwide. Here in Canada, there were approximately 100,000 per year in the same time period. Canada's number has come down a bit in recent years, but anything higher than zero is too many. Yeah, that's right. Pro-abortionists tend to focus on a woman's right to choose what happens inside her body, but this completely misses the point which is whether the preborn baby is a human being. If so, then he or she also has rights. It's mind-boggling to think that ending a human life could be considered a matter of personal choice, mm -hmm. like choosing a career or dieting. Let's put some of the pro-abortion arguments in perspective by applying the two-year-old test. Whenever there's a reference to a fetus, substitute two-year-old. For example, it's the right of every two-year-old to be wanted. We're not pro-killing two-year-olds, we're pro-choice. Unless you're prepared to adopt this two-year-old, you have no right to tell the mother she should not kill her. If we don't make it possible for the mother to kill her two-year-old safely, then she'll do it unsafely and possibly put her own health in danger. Now that sounds shocking, but you can see the logic. Why should killing a pre-born baby be any less monstrous than killing a toddler, a teenager, or an adult? They're all human beings at different stages of development. Other arguments include that the preborn child is just a clump of cells, or that embryos pass through various evolutionary stages on the way to becoming human. By that logic, one might be aborting a fish or a reptile rather than a human. But that notion comes from a long discredited evolutionary argument based on fraudulent drawings by Ernst Haeckel. While this idea may still show up in an occasional biology text or online video, most evolutionists know it's completely false. Even if it were true, the notion that an embryo can be aborted while it's in a fish or reptile state implies that it becomes more valuable when it reaches human form. Mm. Well, this runs contrary to evolution. But what about the so-called clump of cells? Even the first fertilized egg has its own unique DNA code that's distinctly human and different from both parents, so not the mother's body. This new life will follow these pre-programmed instructions to grow and develop into a human baby, and eventually a full-grown adult. Science has shown that birth changes where the child is, not what the child is. Psalm 139, 13 and 14 reads, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I love it when science catches up with the Bible. Yeah, me too. Secular pro-life is run by three atheist women who wish to advance secular arguments against abortion. They outline their argument as follows. Number one, the human zygote, embryo, and fetus are all human organisms. They are early developmental stages of a human's life cycle. Two, all human organisms are morally relevant. Three, it's generally immoral to kill humans. And four, bodily rights aren't enough to justify elective abortion. In 2019, Ph.D. candidate Steve Jacobs surveyed thousands of biology professors and found that 96% of them believe life begins at conception. 
Out of the 5,577 biologists surveyed, 85% identified as pro-choice and 63% as non-religious. Now, Jacobs wasn't trying to support the pro-life position. Instead, he found himself trying to explain how so many biologists could be pro-choice while acknowledging life begins at conception. Hmm. He wrote, Philosophers such as Peter Singer and Judith Jarvis Thompson have outlined abortion defenses that recognize a fetus's humanity while also rejecting the argument that fetuses have rights. We'll look at both of those arguments later. If not everyone believes it's wrong to kill a human being just because he or she is human, there must be more to it. We'll explore more after this. How do fish survive in Antarctic waters without freezing? The answer is that their blood plasma has lots of antifreeze protein that bind to ice and prevent the crystals from growing and thus causing damage. Some evolutionists claim that this is an example of evolution in action because new DNA code has been created that codes for the antifreeze protein. But does this really support molecules to man evolution? Antifreeze proteins are quite different from the complex specific proteins found elsewhere in the fish or in our own bodies. They are simple proteins which may have arisen through the duplication of a digestive enzyme gene that lost its original function due to mutations scrambling it. Even though they fortuitously prevent ice crystals from growing, this is a very non-specific job that many different random proteins could perform. So, even though antifreeze proteins help fish survive, they don't explain how complex specific proteins could arise by mutations. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Welcome back. We've been talking about abortion, and we'll get into more of the science later. First, let's explore why murder is wrong. If your worldview says all living things evolved by random processes over billions of years, then it's logical to conclude humans are no more valuable than chimpanzees, trees, or insects. For the humanist, humans are the highest form of life and deserve the greatest amount of respect. But God is higher than all creation, and only he gets to decide what is morally right or wrong. In Genesis 9-6, God says, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. Humans are created distinct from other creatures, and killing a human is particularly serious because it involves destroying an image bearer. But then there's the fuzzy concept of personhood. Wait, humans are fuzzy? No, persons. But wait, aren't humans and persons the same thing? Apparently not everyone thinks so. Peter Singer, professor of bioethics at Princeton University, wrote, Human babies are not born self-aware or capable of grasping that they exist over time. They are not persons, but animals are self-aware, and therefore the life of a newborn is of less value than the life of a pig, a dog, or a chimpanzee. It's ridiculous. The idea is that biology determines humanity, but personhood determines worth. However, it's always been dangerous to question the personhood of certain human beings. Indeed. Such thinking has led to things like slavery and the Holocaust. In fact, in Canada, at one time, women were denied the vote because they were not considered persons either. Yet, ironically, some of the folks currently denying personhood to pre-born babies are women. Ouch. That sounds harsh, but consider a common scenario. A woman finds out she's pregnant. Pro-abortionists would say she alone can choose to abort or not because it's her body. If she decides to keep the baby, studies indicate she'll probably make healthy choices during pregnancy, like abstaining from alcohol. Great, but is it for her own health or is she taking her pre-born child into consideration? Did anyone consider the child when she was deciding whether or not to abort? If not, what changed? Did the baby become a person because he or she is wanted by the mother? The right to choose is often considered to be in line with feminism as it empowers women. Or does it? Susan B. Anthony's newsletter, The Revolution, described abortion as child murder, infanticide, and feticide. Anthony's friend Elizabeth Cady Stanton argued, When you consider that women have been treated as property, it is degrading to women that we should treat our children as property to be disposed of as we see fit. In our time, the organization Feminists for Life asserts, Abortion is a reflection that we have not met the needs of women. And abortion is not as safe for the mother as we've been told.
There's a risk of heavy bleeding, infection, autoimmune diseases, regret, and depression. And the complication rate for chemical abortions is four times higher than for surgical ones. There are risks in carrying a child to term, but studies show that women who have abortions have a much higher mortality rate than those who give birth. And of course, abortion is never safe for the child. In some countries, more female babies are aborted than males. In Genesis 1.27, God created both male and female in his image. But in an evolutionized world, why not regard girls as inferior and abort them? There's also a higher abortion rate among babies with mental and physical challenges. In the UK, 9 out of 10 women choose to abort their child once they find out he or she might have Downs. Denmark is attempting to eliminate Down syndrome by abortion. This is eugenics in action, an idea spawned by evolutionary thought. Back to personhood. Apostate Minister Joseph Fletcher proposed personhood requirements like minimum intelligence, self-awareness, memory, and communication. But at what stage does a child become self-aware? What is minimum intelligence and who decides? If memory is a criteria, many elderly people suffering from dementia could be considered not persons. What about communication? Is a deaf-mute individual not a person? How about pain? A 2010 study in the UK concluded that preborn babies do not feel pain in the first 24 weeks. Others have disputed the findings, but even if it's true, could we then justify killing someone who is under anesthesia? Someone might say the early embryo doesn't look human, but it looks exactly the way a human should look at that stage. Yeah. If human appearance is a factor, well, that would mean protecting babies at 15 weeks of gestation. This is where Dobbs comes in. As Mississippi's Gestational Age Act states, except in a medical emergency or in the case of a severe fetal abnormality, a person shall not intentionally or knowingly perform or induce an abortion of an unborn human being if the probable gestational age of the unborn human being has been determined to be greater than 15 weeks. It's interesting they refer to an unborn human being at 15 weeks. Now, if we could just get them to have the same acknowledgement from the moment of conception. Amen. At 15 weeks, a baby is about the size of an apple with all of his or her organs. Baby is kicking, curling toes, and moving his or her arms. Just about all pregnancy guidebooks and websites use the term baby or child at this stage. Let's go back even further. At four weeks, the baby's eyes and limbs are developing and his or her heart can be viewed on an ultrasound. At eight weeks, the baby has distinct facial features and fingerprints are starting to form. At 10 weeks, baby's brain is growing rapidly, producing almost 250,000 neurons every minute. At week 12, the baby can smile and gender is identifiable. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, gender is biologically identifiable, even in the womb. Here's a 4D ultrasound image of a baby at 20 weeks. It's no wonder that abortion on demand after 20 weeks is allowed in very few countries. Babies as young as 22 weeks can survive outside the womb. Justice Samuel Alito made it clear they were not taking a position on the nature of the unborn, merely interpreting the Constitution. However, we can learn something from earlier laws. English laws from the 13th to 18th century condemned abortion. In the 19th century, almost all states made abortion a crime at all stages. When Roe was imposed, 30 states still banned abortion for any reason except to save the life of the mother. When the Dobbs decision came down, about 16 states had trigger laws in place to restrict or ban abortion as soon as Roe was overturned. Clearly, many people in the U.S. have and still do consider abortion to be wrong. But let's see what the Bible says. Yes, let's. In Exodus 21, 22 to 24, we read, When men strive together and hit a pregnant woman so that her children come out, but there is no harm, the one who hit her shall surely be fined, as the woman's husband shall impose on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. So there was an additional penalty if an unborn child was harmed. Note the term children, not clumps of cells. Yeah, and the late first century Christian work Didache says, 
The second commandment of the teaching, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not seduce boys, you shall not commit fornication, you shall not steal, you shall not practice magic, you shall not use potions, you shall not procure an abortion, nor destroy a newborn child. God considers the preborn child to be human and worthy of his attention. In Genesis 25, 23, God tells Rebekah, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. Later, God says to Jeremiah, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. When we come back, we'll address some more arguments used by pro-abortionists. What do marine fossils on the top of Mount Everest tell us about the biblical flood? Well, we find fossils of marine creatures in limestone near the summit, which means that this area must have been under the sea in the past. Everyone agrees that the top of Everest was once under the sea. However, many people do not associate these rocks and fossils with Noah's flood because they think there is not enough water to cover the highest mountains. However, they are not considering how the flood changed the Earth's topography. The mountain ranges formed at the end of the flood. With vertical earth movements towards the end of the flood, the mountains rose and the water flowed off the continents into the newly formed ocean basins. Indeed, such mountains must have formed quickly and recently, otherwise they would have eroded as quickly as they formed. That's why we have marine fossils at the top of high mountains. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. There are so many contradictions and just bad arguments used to try to support killing pre-born children. Yeah, but so many people have bought into them and the result is innocent people are being killed. Help us get this information out far and wide by giving the video a like, subscribing and sharing the video on Twitter and Facebook. The more interaction the video gets by doing those things, the more the algorithm suggested to others. And if more people see it, hopefully it will result in fewer abortions. There's more bad argumentation to refute, so let's get back to it. Now that we've established preborn babies are human from conception, let's focus on some of the other arguments put forward by pro-abortionists. Years ago, Judith Jarvis Thompson put forward a hypothetical scenario. Suppose you wake up in a hospital to discover that because you have the same rare blood type, your circulatory system has been connected to that of a famous violinist with a serious kidney infection. The hospital claims you are now morally compelled to stay connected until the violinist can function independently, at least nine months. Thompson asks whether you would feel morally obliged to go along. Her point is that the right to life of one person does not override the right of another person to choose what happens to his or her body. She argues that even if we grant the humanity of the unborn baby, she has no ethical or moral right to the use of her mother's body to sustain her life. It's actually not a very good argument. Francis Beckwith pointed out some ethical problems in his book, Politically Correct Death. Number one, Thompson's analogy assumes all moral obligations to offspring are voluntary, but both parents have involuntary obligations because they had sex knowing it could result in pregnancy. Number two, Thompson equates volunteerism with family morality, which involves personal obligations to our offspring, which we don't have to others. Number three, the preborn child has a right to the mother's body because he or she is dependent on its mother at this stage of development. And there's no reason to deny that right if the child is a human, as Thompson allows. Number four, abortion is not simply withholding treatment, but is actually the killing of the baby. Hmm. In the analogy, there's no guarantee the violinist will die, but abortion is intended to kill. Thompson's point is that a woman should have autonomy over her body and everything in it, even another human being. By that logic, a woman could continue drinking alcohol knowing that the baby could develop fetal alcohol syndrome. Who knows why someone would do that, but then why would someone deliberately have a baby chopped up and vacuumed? Terrible things can happen when fallen human beings are in charge. Consider that your body is not your own. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Thompson's analogy implies that unwanted pregnancies are always forced on a woman. Mm. 
Only about 1% of abortion decisions are the result of rape, and only 0.5% are from incest. The vast majority of women seeking an abortion engaged in sex voluntarily. It's estimated 3 out of 4 sexual assaults are not reported, but that still doesn't justify abortion on demand. Please understand, rape is a terrible and violent assault that no woman should ever have to go through. That's right. But in what other scenario is it permissible for a victim of a crime to retaliate against an innocent third party? If someone beats you up in a parking lot, no one suggests you go and punch your neighbor's kid. It used to be said, two wrongs don't make a right. Oddly enough, in 2000, an Elliott Institute survey of 164 pregnant rape victims found that 73% of them chose to give birth. Hmm. In 1981, Dr. Sandra Mackhorn conducted research of 37 pregnant rape victims in the U.S. 75 to 85% chose to give life to their children. Rebecca Kiesling was conceived in rape and is grateful she was not executed for her father's crime. She says, whenever you identify yourself as being pro-choice or whenever you make that exception for rape, what that really translates into is you being able to stand before me, look me in the eye, and say to me, I think your mother should have been able to abort you. What about abortion to save the mother's life? This comes up when there is an ectopic pregnancy, meaning that the fertilized egg has implanted outside the uterus, such as the fallopian tube. Keep in mind, this is not a normal healthy pregnancy. It carries serious risk for the mother, but removing the ectopic pregnancy is not considered an abortion. However, it is a genuine life-for-life -life situation. In this case, the death of the child is accidental, not intended. Knowledge of consequences that will result from committing an action is not the same as intending those consequences. It's sometimes even possible to save the child with emergency C-section and incubation. By contrast, the intent of an abortion is always to produce a dead baby. When we come back, do pro-lifers really care about the child? Many people think that Charles Darwin first thought of the idea of natural selection. However, others prior to Darwin described the concept, although they sometimes used slightly different terminology. For instance, Carl Linnaeus, the creationist father of taxonomy, wrote of a struggle for survival in nature. Similarly, James Hutton wrote about the concept of natural selection. Probably the most influential character was Edward Blythe, an English chemist and zoologist who wrote major articles on natural selection two decades before Darwin published On the Origin of Species. Darwin differed in trying to use the concept of natural selection to promote the idea of unlimited change. However, modern studies of natural selection have revealed that it is limited. It can only select between variations that already exist. It is incapable of producing the new genetic information required for true evolutionary change to occur, such as growing feathers on a reptile. Natural selection is not evolution. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Welcome back. We've examined various aspects of the abortion issue and answered several pro-abortion arguments. Here's another one. If you were really pro-life, you'd pay for the upkeep of the child until he or she reaches 18. If you're not prepared to do that, then you have no right to oppose abortion. There are several reasons why this argument doesn't work. If you see a child being abused by their parents, do you call the authorities only if you're prepared to raise him or her to adulthood? Well, just because we can't adopt every unwanted child doesn't mean we shouldn't try to save their lives. But suppose pro-lifers really don't care about babies after they're born. Does that mean it's okay to let them be slaughtered? Uh, no. No. It's also rather melodramatic and manipulative to say that anyone who doesn't actively support a child's welfare after birth must want that child dead. Mm. If someone comes to your door asking for donations for cancer research and you decline, does that mean you want everyone with cancer to die? Of course not. No. And the idea that pro-lifers are pro-birth only is not even true. That's right. Pro-lifers are at the forefront of care for mothers and babies. In the U.S., pro-life pregnancy counseling centers outnumber Planned Parenthood abortion mills, over three to one. Yet those centers receive little to no government funding, while Planned Parenthood receives $500 million a year. A pro-abortion group called Action Canada for Sexual Health and Rights has complained that in Canada, there are more crisis pregnancy centers than abortion providers, including hospitals. Sounds great. 
This group has claimed that crisis pregnancy centers are giving out false information, but they haven't offered any real proof. One objection they have is that some of these centers offer ultrasounds, which they say can trick people into believing they're a medical facility. The gas station has an ATM, but no one mistakes it for a bank. <laughs> but an ultrasound could help a woman realize her baby is not just a clump of cells. That's right. And that may affect her decision. Maybe that's the real objection. Yeah, one research paper indicated that pregnant women who visit crisis pregnancy centers are 20% less likely to choose abortion than those who don't. Good. The study authors suggested that this must be at least partly because the centers lie to people. For example, Narl Pro-Choice America conducted an undercover investigation in which they said, more than 67% of the locations intentionally referred to the fetus as baby and told our investigator she was already a mother because she was already pregnant. That's certainly a pro-life perspective, but it's also factually accurate. <laughs> Most pregnancy centers are upfront about what services they do and do not provide. The name alone, pregnancy center, should be a clue that their focus is on pregnancy, not abortion. That's right. Oddly enough, many offer counseling for those who do choose an abortion, even though they don't perform them. Meanwhile, it's been suggested that other organizations tend to give the impression that abortion is the only option. Mm -hmm. It's not. No. Adoption is a great alternative for any mother who feels unprepared to raise a child, but wants the child to live a happy life. There are more couples wanting to adopt than there are babies available, but government bureaucracy makes it difficult. Since Dobbs, some corporations have started offering to fly pregnant employees to states where abortion is legal, since it's cheaper than paid maternity leave. Planned Parenthood doesn't offer paid parental leave to its employees. Perhaps they consider it a conflict of interest. Wouldn't it be wonderful if governments and employers put as much money into options that help struggling moms look after their babies as they do in helping them eliminate them? We live in a sin-cursed world with all kinds of problems, like poverty and hunger. But we'll have a better chance of combating those problems if there are more bright young minds around to work on them. Yeah, that's right. The unfounded accusation that pregnancy centers give out false information has given the government of Canada an excuse to try and shut down these centers. For a government that calls itself pro-choice, it's odd that they would pursue measures that would give pregnant women fewer choices. It gets worse. Pro-abortion terrorist groups such as Jane's Revenge have bombed and vandalized some of these centers with slogans like, if abortions aren't safe, then neither are you. For such groups, the objective is very clearly abortion rather than care for the mother or the unwanted child. Very sad. Some say it's all about a woman's right to choose, but no one, man or woman, has the right to end a human life. No. Laws are often designed to restrict our choices from harming others. Laws against drunk driving are meant to protect others from possibly getting hurt, whereas abortion always hurts a child and sometimes the mother. And most laws are based on a biblical worldview. But if evolution is true, then there's no God, so no objective moral authority. Instead, anything goes. Things like slavery and genocide become a matter of choice. Right. We might as well empty the prisons and shut down the courts. Instead, we pray that everyone will come to realize that pre-born babies are human and that God loves them as well as their parents. That's right. Much of the content for this episode came from articles at creation.com. Visit the website there and check out the many free articles there, as well as you can get a free magazine at creation.com slash free mag. And we'd love to hear from you. You can uh, go to the feedback section on our website and you can submit a, a question if you don't find what you're looking for on the site. We'll see you next week, and remember, Christianity is an evidence-based faith. And science supports scripture. Wait, 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 don't go just yet. If you learned something from this episode, then others will too. Share this video as widely as you can, and if you haven't yet, click that like button. Leave a comment about what you found most interesting or respond to other comments. Those activities help push the video to other people's feeds. Thanks for watching.